Um, and uh, so it's my honour to be able to share with you this morning. Uh, I've really been uh, enjoying the, the season that we're in as a church in a way. And even though we're living in very trying times and there's a lot of issues of society and the world that we could be concerned about, um, it, is, uh, it is exciting times to be living in. And uh, uh, it was quite good to see, uh, terrific to see the ICFM conference and the theme that they had for that and standing strong in these days and of course Pastor Don ministered here and who was blessed by Pastor Don's ministry he was just fantastic man of God moves in the spirit and I want to be just building on a little bit about I guess what we covered there um, also Jonathan Ayling last week he was something different I mean the amazing thing is these guys are completely different there's different anointings with them but there's a, there's a theme that's running through a lot of these messages and also if you might recall when I spoke a couple of months ago um, I was talking about uh, staying the course and running our race with perseverance. And I, I want to refer to that shortly again in a minute. But I, I believe that these are, are crucial times for the church. I believe that um, you know the church in many ways in the, in the Western world, and New Zealand's probably no exception, is generally blended in with society. It's been an accepted part of the community. And the values, if you like, that churches and, and Christianity stands for were very much in line with what most decent people in the community would agree with as well. And so it was, it was quite a good synergy there. We haven't had persecution or been challenged like uh, churches in, in third world countries or in Muslim countries, for instance, um, and communist countries where there has been a lot of persecution. So we've had it pretty good. But I tell you, things are changing and they're changing really, really rapidly. And we are being marginalized more and more and being seen as being unreasonable, as being fundamentalists, as being bigots, and there's all sorts of labels thrown at us. And, um, and uh, so society is, is taking a different view and we are being challenged on, on our Christian worldview, our biblical worldview. Judeo-Christian biblical worldview, all being challenged and turned upside down. And it seems to be happening very, very, um, very, very quickly. And uh, the thing is, the church is, and I think church leaders, in fact, all of us have probably got to, uh, uh, you know, have got to wrestle with this. And the COVID thing was a, a classic example about what churches did with that. What are we going to do? Are we going to blend in and try and go with the flow uh, under the pretense of trying to stay relevant, or are we going to make a stand? And, uh, and stand up for righteousness and truth and freedom. It's, I think it's a very critical time. It's a question that I think church leaders in particular are going to have to ask themselves all around the world and in the nation. And uh, we're all going to have to ask that ourselves. Um, you know, I just uh, noticed this week that uh, Christopher Luxton, the uh, leader of the opposition, the National Party, he, uh, he has been recorded on record as saying that he's anti-abortion, for instance. And, uh, of course, we've had that decision come out of America where they've overturned the, the Roe versus Wade uh, abortion mandate, which is fantastic news. That's an answer to the prayer of the saints. It's absolutely, we can rejoice in that. But somehow they're making it an issue here, and they're using this to pick on Luxton. Now, I'm not a great Luxton fan. I'm not supporting him. I'm not against him. But I'm, all I'm saying, here's the principle of someone who stands up, which not so many years ago would have been seen as a virtue to be anti-abortion. And now they're saying it's going to cost you the election and they're questioning him and are you going to change the legislation? He's getting all sorts of flack over it. It's unbelievable. I'm, I, mean, I'm, I mean, politicians have got to play the game a little bit. I sort of understand that. So he, he's ducking for cover and dodging and diving and fair enough, I guess that's what politicians do. We're not politicians. We're the church. Our position doesn't need to change. We've only got one person to please and that's Jesus. So I, I, as I say, I think it's a, a very important time that we're talking about and... Um, as I say, Jesus says he's coming back. He doesn't want to come back for a lukewarm church. We've got to know where we are. We've got to be standing strong and standing up for our biblical values. And it's not necessarily going to be easy. And it's not going to get easier. That's what we're facing right now. And I think you might as well make the decision now. Make the resolve in your heart. Because <laughs> otherwise you're going to be vacillating, sitting on the fence. And it's not going to be pleasant. You don't want to be one or the other. You make your decision. And I tell you, there's a right decision to make. And I want to share about it a bit today. Anyway, let's pray. Commit our time to the Lord. Father, we just want to thank you again today for our time together. We want to thank you for your word. Uh, I just submit myself and I submit this time into your hands. And I pray that once again you'd speak to each and every one of us. The Holy Spirit, you would come upon each person, Lord, and bring revelation, bring understanding, and, and, and guide us and lead us in all that you want us to be and all that you've called us to do. And we submit our time into your hands. We give you praise and glory. And we welcome your presence here in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty. Well, you might recall that last time... Uh, when I spoke, um, as I say, a couple of months ago now, I used a, a key scripture. And I just quickly want to look at it again. It was from Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 3. 
He said, therefore, since we are surrounded by such great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Boy, is that still speaking to me, that scripture now, all these months later, I'm still dwelling over it. I mean, this scripture encourages us to keep going, to endure the opposition of sinners, not to grow weary, not to lose heart, even in trying days. You know, some people say, say when they look around, they think, goodness, I've had enough of this. Come back, Jesus, get me out of here. Beam me up, Scotty. I want out. I want out. And, um, and I understand that. And we should be looking forward to the, the second coming of Jesus. Absolutely, we should. But, you know, while we're here, we need to stand strong. We need to stay on course and we do the, the best we can. And we're here for a reason. See, God is, is wanting all people to be saved. Otherwise, he'd take us out of here. So he's got a plan and a purpose. So we've got to make the most of the time that we have here and not lose sight that uh, we are to be disciples of Jesus Christ. And we need to run this race with perseverance. You, um, you may recall when I was telling a story when about running your race with perseverance, I used the example of, um, of my running because I was practicing uh, at that time to do a, a marathon run, a uh, half a marathon, I should say. Goodness, I couldn't do a marathon, but a, a half marathon, which was going to be a challenge and enough. And I, I talked about things that can hinder. And when a, a runner's running, he doesn't want to be carrying extra weight and, and so on. And I told the story about how I'd been out running and I was out a bit too long and die had... Um, Got, when I got home, she was all worried. She was, oh, you know, I thought something might have happened to you. Are you not to go out running long like that again unless you take your phone with you? And so she berated me and said, I must take my phone when, uh, when I go running. But I, I'm thinking, I don't want to have this argument. So yes, dear, yes, dear. And uh, as, I, as, I, as I walked out the door, I put it in the letterbox and just carried on. And, um, and so, uh, but anyway, the story continues. Uh, be sure your sins will find you out. Because um, what happened was, I, when I shared that with you, you might recall the story if you were here. I shared that here with you, and uh, and I think that was the first time Di actually knew about it that I put the phone in the letterbox rather than taking it with me. Well, you wouldn't believe it. Um, a week later, after I'd shared the message here, I'm out running again, doing one of my normal training runs. I was about three k from home, running along, and then ping ah, a tendon in my upper leg, groin area, pinged and didn't, didn't break obviously, but. I just couldn't walk. I'm going, oh, and I went down. And I just stopped running. I thought, what am I going to do? Where's my cell phone? I, need, <laughs> I needed someone to come and pick me up. And um, of course, I didn't have it. And so I had to hobble home. And I'm talking hobble home. I had to hobble home about 3K. And I'm sort of, oh, no, no. So I walk in the door. And there's Di, as women do. <laughs> wow. So I had to, um, I fessed up. And um, and uh, and uh, and so I, uh, she'd caught me out. You see, if you'd had your phone, if you'd had your phone, you could have rung. So anyway, so I got caught out. But I've only, I've learned a lesson from it, and I know what the lesson is. If your wife tells you to do something, and you don't do it, and you get caught out. Never tell her about the mistake. <laughs> you never live it down. Yeah, so that's what happened there. Anyway, I'm pleased to say that uh, my, my injury came right, and I was able to continue training. And two weeks ago. I ran the half marathon, the Wellington half marathon, and, uh, and completed that. So very, praise God. I'm very, very pleased to have done that. And um, yeah, it was a good achievement. In fact, a huge crowd. It was about 5,000 people. It was, it was amazing. Um, so yeah, very good. All right, so what are we talking about? Yeah, things that hinder us. That's right. So the, that scripture goes on to say, run with perseverance. And it says, keeping our eyes on Jesus. And this talks to me, you know, as I mentioned, about focus and about priorities in our lives. I think it's really important. We fix our eyes on Jesus. That's how we're going to stand strong. That's how we're going to finish our race. We've got to keep our eyes on him in these turbulent times. And it was quite funny, actually, during that race, when I got there um, in a big crowd, I'm not a, I, as I say, I don't do a lot of running. Um, and uh, I, I, I wanted to sort of had a goal of what I, time I wanted to finish it in. But of course, when you're running with people, it's very hard sometimes to gauge the distance and how fast you're going or how slow you're going. But it was quite good. The organisers had um, what they called uh, uh, pacemakers, pace setters. And so what they did is they had, I didn't think there'd be anybody running um, slow enough for me, but they, they did have someone at about the speed that I wanted to go. And they had the little flags on their, on, their, uh, on their backs with the time, the finish time. And I thought, I knew basically how, how fast I trained at. And I thought, good, yes, if I can find someone who can do it in that time, um, I'll be good to go. 
And so it was 2 hours 15 for those who are, really want to know. And uh, so I said, if you can rate, do your 21K in two, 2 hours 15, I said, this is exactly what I can do. It was stretched me, but I'd be about right. So this lady had the sign with the 2 hours 15. Well, I just ran with her the whole way, and I was running along, and I get distracted, and I think, oh, where is she? Oh, there she is again. So I just followed her all the way along, and I thought, man, that reminds me, you know, fixing your eyes on Jesus. And actually, because I did that, and just kept with her. It must have made it so much easier. And I, we finished the race together, and uh, it was just absolutely brilliant. So fix your eyes on Jesus, and he'll get you across the finishing line. He'll get you there. You'll run your race, and you'll finish your race. Praise God. So, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was, it was a, a great day. So fix our eyes on Jesus, and he'll get us through. As I say, it's easy to get distracted when running, but even in life, we can get so busy, and that's what I talked about, distractions and so on, the busyness of life. But we remind ourselves to keep the main thing, the main thing. Not distracted from our calling, not time to wander off course. We need to stay committed and focused to obeying Jesus and representing him to the world. As Pastor Don was saying, we shouldn't be living just quiet, passive Christian lives. Jonathan, uh, Jonathan Ayling last week touched on that as well. We've got to do something. We need to engage. We're a light, remember? Jesus has called us a light unto the world. And of course, you don't hide a light, he said in the scripture, under the basket. You let it shine for people to see. And that's what we're called to be. We've got to stand up for righteousness, stand up for truth, for freedom. We're not running. We're not hiding. We're not afraid. We're not intimidated. And here's what I want to get onto this morning. And the main thing that we need to stand up for. All those things are valid, but the main thing we need to stand up for and engage people about is the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is the theme, really, of my message today. The message today is called Prepared to Give an Answer, and we'll come to that in a minute. There are many issues, as I say, that we should be engaging with, and we do. As this church, you'll know if you've been part of this church for any time, we do engage with issues. We're not afraid to speak up. But the most important is the gospel. Jesus' last command in all four of the, of the gospel books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He says, go into all the world and preach the gospel. We call this the Great Commission. It's what he's asked all of his disciples, all his followers to do at all times. Mark 16, 15 version says this, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. You know, there's one thing the devil will try and stop us doing more than anything else, and that's preaching the gospel because it's the good news. It's the power of God under salvation. He'll try and hinder us. He'll try and discourage us, distract us, keep us busy with other things. Tell us that we don't qualify. We're not good enough. And we shouldn't impose our views on others. But, you know, God has instructed us and he's made us able to do it. Scripture we looked at last week, 2 Corinthians 3, 6. He, being God, made us competent as ministers of the new covenant. Not of the letter of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. God has made us competent. Everyone say competent. Competent. You are competent through the power of the Holy Spirit. You might not feel like it. It does not matter. Because the one who's in you is greater. We're all ministers of the new covenant by the Holy Spirit. What's the new covenant? It's just the New Testament. What's the message of the New Testament? It's the gospel of grace. The gospel of grace, the good news about Jesus. The Old Covenant, the Old Testament was all about works, what we had to do. The New Covenant, the New Testament is all about what Jesus has done. That's where ministers of that. And we're all competent. We all have the ability. That's what that means. We all have the ability to share. And we've all been called to do so. And it's nothing to do with how long you've been a Christian. I love some of the testimonies that Pastor Don shared last week about when he was a new Christian on the building sites and so on and some of the things that happened. And oh, I can testify to that as well. Probably not as dramatic as, as Pastor Don. But I remember when I got saved, um, I'd read a book. It was the Alpha book called Questions of Life. And I'd read it and I'd given my heart to the Lord. And it just touched me so much that God was actually real. And it was, you know, and salvation was important. And I need to make my life right with him. I was, just, I was just blown away and so excited. So I thought, right. I, this, I read this book, it got, this did the trick. So I went out and I bought a couple of dozen of these books. And I gave them out to all my friends and people I knew, thinking, well, they'll read the book and they'll, they'll get saved as well. Didn't quite work like that. But um, we, we were, uh, you know, I was just on fire and I went out and I started sharing with people. And, and, uh, and uh, you know, I, it didn't matter that I didn't have good theology necessarily or understand the Bible in its fullness. I just shared about the goodness of God and what He had done in my life. 
and uh, that he was real. And uh, Di, she, uh, she came to the Lord a, a few months later. I led a, a, another friend of mine uh, that I'd shared with. He, he came to the Christ uh, within six months. It was amazing. And I've got a good friend of mine here sitting in the front row. Might have thought he's my brother by the, from the back view, but uh, <laughs> he is my brother. He's my brother in Christ. Now, good friend of mine, John. Now he got he got. We were mates way way back. He got saved way before I did. I wasn't. I was thirty nine before I got saved. John got saved in his early twenties, and uh, but I know he witnessed to me way back then. And he reached out. And he's had a great ministry in reaching out to people as well with the gospel. And uh, he prayed for me. And here he is today. He's decided to visit church today. I'm preaching. I thought he's sitting in the front row ready to heckle me. But, um, <laughs> but uh, he's a good friend. Now, now, John, I'll just do a little, little commercial plug here. Uh, John, John is a, a great Christian man. He owns a cafe in Upper Hutt called Sugar and Spice in Wakatiki Street. So you go and support that cafe. They're out there and they're reaching out to people through the cafe. They're sharing the gospel. He's doing a great job. All right. So that's a, I'll give you a free advertising there. You can pay me later. All right. <laughs> <laughs> ah, he's a good friend and uh, yeah I've got no doubt that you know we all came to Christ didn't we because somebody prayed for us somebody shared with us reached out to us and maybe one just sowed a seed someone else watered but God eventually gave the growth and we get born again so that's what we're called to do okay so um, yeah as I say nothing to do with how, uh, how long you've been saved we're all called to do it and we can all do it get involved and as many um we can get involved, as I say, with so many things. And as many of them are valid and necessary. And I know now, in Christian life, I've got involved in church life here, and I'm very involved in the, in the church. But you can get busy doing so many things that you can sometimes forget what the main thing is. And um, I, I guess I'm probably as guilty as that as anybody. Um, but it, sh it should never be, no matter how busy we are, it should never be at the expense of sharing the gospel. And we're all competent. We are all competent. We all have the ability to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Another scripture that I love, love, and it's always just inspired me, is Acts 1.8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So we're empowered by the Holy Spirit. Once again, it's emphasizing that, to be a witness. And what does a witness do? It just tells of what they've seen, what they've experienced. And he said, you'll be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. So he wasn't just talking to the disciples because the disciples never went to the ends of the earth. That's us. We're in New Zealand. We're the ends of the earth. It's talking to all people. The Spirit, Holy Spirit is upon us. And, and Jesus said it himself. Even he needed the Holy Spirit. Luke 4, 18, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the good news, to preach the gospel. Anointed. We're anointed. Anointed means empowered by the Holy Spirit. To do what he's called us to do. Now next week I'm going to explain. I'm uh, going to continue the, the, the message next week. And I'm going to focus then on, on, on the gospel. He's anointed us to preach the gospel. Which means good news. Now what is that good news? If I asked you and did a survey here. Of what do you think the gospel message is? You would all basically touch on it I'm sure. But it, it is a very specific message and the thing is that you might understand what it is in your heart and you've believed there's no question about that I'm sure but are you able to if someone asked you are you able to explain it to somebody clearly so next week I want to go over that because there are very important things in the gospel that we all need to understand and I don't want to assume that everybody knows many of you do but it's worth declaring because as we preach the gospel even as I teach you I'm declaring it as well and it is the most powerful declaration that we can make why we need to be saved, how we can be saved, and the role that Jesus plays. It's so important that we can explain this to others clearly. But my message today is more focusing on the importance and the priority of being a witness for Jesus. As I say, every Christian should desire to share their faith and know how to do it. And uh, which brings me really, I guess, to the, probably the main scripture that I wanted to focus on today, which is from 1 Peter 3.15. And I see this says, says it so clearly. It says, In your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. We need to take our light, the presence, the power of the Holy Spirit that's in us and engage with our world and be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have. This is the most powerful and more important message the church has. You know, when you see what's going on around us, it's very easy to criticize, complain, moan and groan. But we could to give an answer for the hope. 
the hope that we have. And our hope far outweighs all this negative stuff that's going on around us. All the concerning issues, the legislation that's being passed. We're in end times. And we know the Bible says that lawlessness will abound. There'll be terrible times. There'll be tough times. Opposition will come. But that's what we're, the times we're moving into and going to be experiencing. And I, I don't know necessarily that, you know, it's going to get any better. I mean, I think the light's going to shine lighter, but the dark will probably get darker. And there's a sort of a, a paradox there. But, um, you know, and we are in end times. And, and I mean, there's a lot of focus in the church about end times, the second coming of Christ. But the problem is that many people haven't even heard about the first time. So we've got to focus on getting that news out there, church, as, 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 as the time approaches. Uh, approaches. The proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ has to be a priority. And I want to, you got it in your outline there, you, I want to quote Derek Prince, a great Bible teacher who, who really helped me as a new Christian, getting me found uh, established in the word of God. And he, he makes this quote here, and I just say amen, amen, amen to it. He said, the supreme purpose of every true Christian church, the chief duty of every Christian minister, the main responsibility of every Christian layman is to present to all who may be reached in the clearest and most forceful way the basic facts of the gospel of Christ and then to urge all who hear it to make a definite personal response to these facts which God requires. To this, the supreme task, every other duty and activity of the church must be secondary and subsidiary. The church does a lot of wonderful things and they're all necessary. Don't get me wrong. I'm not belittling anything else that we do as a church. But there has to be something has to be the most important. And this is it. The Great Commission. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Must be our priority. So 1 Peter 3.15. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. In the Amplified Version, I'll, we'll look at that as well. It says, In your hearts there set Christ apart as holy, acknowledging him, giving him first place in your lives as Lord. Always be ready to give a logical defense to anyone who asks you to account for the hope and the confident assurance that is within you, and yet do it with gentleness and respect. So let's have a look at that. Obviously, the first part's pretty obvious. Jesus must be Lord of our lives. We must be submitted to his rule in our lives. Then it says, be one version says, ready, be prepared. We're willing to obey and to follow. It's a key thing. I'll touch on that a little bit more later. We must be ready to answer. That means to say something, to speak out, know what to say. I'll teach more on that next week. But there must be a confidence. There must be an assurance in our heart that we know that we know and we believe it. And that we're not intimidated. We are prepared to give an answer for the hope that we have and the reason for our hope. We don't have to prove anything. It's not, it says a reason, not proof. Don't ever say you can try and prove anything about God. Okay, you get yourself in trouble. There is an argument for apologetics and, 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 and that sort of side of it. It's saying give a reason. Now, but that's your testimony. Why you believe what you believe. No one can argue with your testimony. No one can argue because it's real to you. They've either then got to decide either you're crazy or you're telling a lie or it's the truth. It's the only choice they've got. And if you are doing it with gentleness and respect and in an honoring way, they're really challenged. What do they believe? So we've got to give a reason for our hope. And we should all know in our heart how to say, give that answer to somebody if they ask us. This is what I'm encouraging you to do. And doing it with gentleness and respect. We've got to be nice to people. Some people, some people are not very nice, but we've got to be nice to them. We have to be positive. We should be polite. You know, people generally respond to nice people, don't they? Someone's nasty to you, you tend to sort of back off, don't you? And you put the walls go up. No. People respond to nice people. Remember, we're presenting good news. <laughs> we're presenting good news. So we should be nice. Jonathan Ayling touched on that last week, didn't he? He said we shouldn't be judgmental, critical or angry or arrogant. But we've got to be bold, but gentle and respectful. And another scripture that I just love that just dovetails into, into, into that and says the same thing, really. In Colossians uh, five, uh, 4, 5, and 6, it says, Be wise in the way you act with people who are not believers. Make the most of every opportunity. When you talk, you should always be kind and pleasant, so you will be able to answer. Answer everyone in the way you should. Be kind and pleasant. Make the most of the opportunities the Holy Spirit gives you. Be ready to give an answer. Not just in general conversation. I'm talking more as implied here about your faith. 
an opportunity to share Christ. It was just, I was so encouraged, you know, a couple of a few of our ladies during the ICFM conference were, were serving, doing the morning teaser next door, when they, when the, um, when the, and the caterers, we were using chalet caterers, at the, and they were coming along and providing the morning tea. Well, the driver used to come every morning, and uh, one morning he came in, and the lady saw him, how are you today? And we were kind and gentle and pleasant, respectful. And he said, oh, well, actually, I've got problems with my eyes, and I'm going to have to go into a hospital, you know, to have an operation. It's quite serious. And uh, so the, the ladies, led by the Spirit, said to him, well, could we pray for you about this? But first, do you know, do you know about Jesus? And uh, can we explain that to you? And the guy said, yes, you can. And so they explained the gospel to them, why Jesus died, why he needed going. And, 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 and the guy was touched. They said they could see a tear falling, forming in his eyes. The power of God was upon him. And so and they said, well, would you like to receive Jesus right now? And so here's the chalet driver delivering the sandwiches, giving his heart to the Lord. Isn't that awesome? Oh, give the Lord a hand. Yes, amen. And of course, then they, they prayed for the guy, making the most of the opportunity. If we make ourselves available, God will use us. Just have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying and following it and being obedient. So praise God for that. Oh, that was just a, a, beautiful, a, a beautiful example. So, but the way we say things, be kind, pleasant, gentle, that makes a way. That makes a way. Relevant speech, as, as Jonathan was talking last week, translation, he, the term he used. Being, being relevant in what we say, like Paul when he was ministering in Athens with all the philosophers of the, of the Greek society. He used their language. He, 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 he engaged with them in, in terms that they would understand and relate to. Not being religious, just use everyday language. Be normal people. I like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9.22. He says, I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. So we adjust to the environment we're in. We adapt our language to the situation we find ourselves in. As I say, we don't need to be theological experts or have some special gift. We just need to engage, put forward our, our biblical views, our values, give an answer for the hope, make the most of the opportunity. Now, I want to move on. And I want to give a, a lesson here, just an example from the life of Philip, the evangelist, uh, which we find in the book of Acts. These are what I would call evangelism principles. Uh, and they apply to Philip, but they can apply to each and every one of us today. And here's a great example of Philip making the most of his opportunities. And also it's a marvelous example, a depiction of how the Holy Spirit works with us in evangelism. So let's read this. It's quite a lengthy part of scripture, a piece of scripture. But let's uh, let's read through this, and then I'll be referring to it as we as we move on. So Acts uh, chapter eight, verse twenty six to forty. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, "Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza." So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasures of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. The man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, he was sitting in the chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. And the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. He said, do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And the eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. And here it goes on to quote from Isaiah. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so did he not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from earth. That was from Isaiah. That's what the eunuch was reading. And then the eunuch asked Philip, Please tell me, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began at that very passage of Scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. Okay, so the story starts actually earlier in Acts, um, in, in Acts chapter 8. Philip was one of the original seven deacons that the disciples had appointed in Jerusalem. And he was successfully serving there. They were seeing signs and wonders and uh, people being saved. Um, and he was 
very comfortable there. But he was the point is here, he was prepared to leave there to go and reach new people. And in this case, he went down to Samaria, who were, were foreigners. The Jews weren't actually supposed to mix with them. So he was prepared to go there. And so he went down to Samaria, it says in verse 5, and he proclaimed Christ there. In other words, he was prepared to get out of his comfort zone to reach other people. And I would uh, encourage us all to do that, to build relationship with, non, with non-Christians. It's not always easy. In fact, we, sometimes we don't want to do it. But I, I met a guy uh, probably 12 years ago. Um, uh, I'll refer to him today a bit. Um, his name, we'll call him Sid. Um, he was a, a temporary immigrant from a, another country that was over here on a work contract. And uh, we didn't have a lot in common, but anyway, God connected us. And uh, then he had a marriage breakup, which was very unfortunate. Then he got in trouble with the law. And um, then he actually ended up in prison. And, uh, and uh, so, you know, I, um, I thought, well, he's got nobody, no one to support him. Uh, so I just felt the Lord saying, well, you've got you've to keep in touch with this guy and encourage this guy. So, you know, uh, for the last nine years, I've been uh, visiting him in prison uh, and, uh, and, you know, made an effort out of my comfort zone to try and represent Jesus to him. And so it wasn't easy, but we must be intentional. We have to make an effort. It's not, never going to generally be convenient, but the Holy, Holy Spirit will lead us. And, but it, as I say, it won't happen unless we are willing and are prepared to make some sort of effort. This is what Jesus did in his ministry. If you look at it, he cared for people. And we're called to do the same. You see, if, he's, if he knows we're willing, he will connect us. 1, 1 Thessalonians 2.8 says this, We loved you so much that we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel, yes, we need to preach the gospel, but also our own lives. We have to invest our lives into the lives of others. That's what Jesus did. Share our lives with others. Philip was prepared, was ready and prepared to do what the Lord asked of him to share his life with others so he moved on so point one is be led by the spirit let's have a look at this Philip was in Samaria as I say it was all going very well there were signs and wonders and miracles great things were happening wow thank you God for bringing here but then God all of a sudden says no it's time to move on the angel of the Lord said to Philip verse 26 go south to the desert road that leads to Gaza sometimes God will lead us things and we don't have the full picture just one step at a time so Philip had left a successful ministry, but he obeyed the Spirit and he traveled on the desert road, not sure what laid ahead. It says he started out, verse 27. He didn't ask why he was being sent from the middle of nowhere, the desert, for goodness sake. What could be happening out there? But he just went. He was obedient to the leading of the Spirit. Now, the Ethiopian eunuch mentioned here was, a, as, a, as the verse says, was a, a, an official of the, the Queen a Candace of e- Ethiopia and he had been up at the temple worshiping. Now, many Ethiopians um, actually were Jews. Because thought to be, uh, the, the thought is that they were descendants of um, King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba when she visited Jerusalem some 500 years before. Um, and also some had converted to Judaism. So he was up doing the Jewish thing, worshipping at the temple. Anyway, this appeared to go out to the desert like this. You would think, well, goodness, what's going on? I've got a successful ministry here. This looks like a demotion. This looks like an inconvenience. Why am I, why am I, going, to the, why am I going to the desert? But actually... By connecting with the Ethiopian, that probably brought the gospel to Ethiopia. So we just don't know sometimes the full picture. See, God had a plan. Just at the right moment, he brought Philip across the Ethiopian's path. No coincidence. And Philip was obedient to the plan. And sometimes we don't, have, you know, we shouldn't overanalyze things. When God calls us to do something, we don't have to sort of pray and fast about it for a year and, you know, overanalyze it and resist and, and make, you know, make assumptions about oh well, is this really God or um, you know we have to be wise and get counsel if need be but uh, sometimes it's just a matter of trusting and obeying in the old song sometimes we just got to trust and obey don't make excuses be obedient you know throughout the Old Testament if you look at look at the Old Testament and you look at God's dealings with Israel it was amazing he was wanting obedience but all the sacrifices there and then he said I've had enough of sacrifices all your offerings all your prayers, all your petitions, all, your, all the sacrifices that you're bringing. He said, they've got, the, they've got their place. He said, but really, I just want obedience. And 1 Samuel, um, what's, what's the verse? I don't think you've got it in your outline. But in 1 Samuel 15, it says, I desire obedience, not sacrifice. In other words, just do what I'm telling you to do. 
We can be doing things, busy things. They may, we may think they have some relevance, and some probably have got some value. But the most important thing is to do what he's telling us to do. Make the main thing the main thing. And another thing here that the Philip, um, I thought when Philip, you know, came across this eunuch, this guy was obviously a a, uh, a pretty important person, like a, a VIP. I mean, he was like the minister of finance. He was in charge of all the all the treasurers, and he had his own chariot. That's probably like having a private jet today. I mean, he was he was pretty well up there. And you can get sometimes intimidated by somebody's st- statue. So God brings you into a situation, and um, and uh, but we, you know, hard sometimes. Not to be intimidated. I was. I, I worked for a boss. He, this guy was very successful, very charismatic, very influential, very influential, very wealthy. Um, he was a power sort of guy. And um, I was a bit intimidated, to be honest. And, um, and uh, so I'd never shared my faith with him. He didn't even know I was a Christian. And for years. And uh, anyway, a time came once when he asked me, and he said, what do you do on the weekend? And we'd had a big weekend at church, I think Saturday and Sunday. So I thought, right, this is it, Lord. Now's the time to come come out and say <laughs> who I am and what I believe. And so I I um I was able to uh, I told him and I was able to share with him, um, and it, and it was it was fine. But I was for for much of the time I was a bit intimidated to to be shared to be honest, um, but as I say we've got to overcome that. We've got to develop a boldness and um, you know stand up uh, even when it we, we might be a little bit concerned what someone might how someone might might react. See, God's uh, windows of opportunity must be taken. Sometimes we just don't know whether we've got a second chance. You know? Who knows? If Philip hadn't obeyed, would, would, would the gospel have got to Ethiopia? I don't know. Proverbs 3.28 says this, Never tell your neighbor to wait until tomorrow if you can help them now. Never wait. Never tell your neighbor to wait until tomorrow if you can help them now. So Philip started out. And then the Holy Spirit gave Philip further instructions. He, the, Philip, the Spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near. See, God's speaking to us all the time. If we'll only listen. Pastor Stephen preached a couple of weeks ago, I wasn't here, but on pursuing God's presence. And I believe pursuing his presence, knowing him intimately is when we hear his voice so much better. You should listen to that message, uh, message if you haven't. And Romans 8, 14 says this, those who are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. So we need to recognize God's voice. So point one is be obedient to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Point two, be prepared to make an effort. Then it says in verse 30, Philip ran up to the chariot. As I was talking about before, running can be hard. It takes some effort. And we don't always want to do it. But generally when you do it, you're always glad you did afterwards. So um, that's what I've found with training. You know, sometimes you don't want to go out for a training and oh, I can't be bothered, it's too cold and you know, I'm too tired and oh, there's something on the telly I want to watch. So you make an excuse. But actually, when you actually finally, when you get over your flesh <laughs> and get out and do it, you always come back and you think, man, I'm glad I did that. It was the same with witnessing. We used to go, um, uh, a few of us for many years used to go out uh, the first Friday of every month into town to witness on the streets. And there was quite often you'd come home and once again, and particularly winter, cold night, oh, do I really want to go into town? Maria would remember, Peter would remember. A few guys have, have done it, done this with us over the years. And, um, and uh, you'd go out and, uh, oh, no, we've just got to do it, you know. So you, um, you do and you go in and you always, and then you come back and you have the most amazing encounters. And you come back rejoicing, thinking, man, I'm glad I did that. But it was, if it was up to the, if it wasn't the power of the Spirit that made me do it, I'd never do it. My flesh would not do it. So, so we thank God for the Holy Spirit. Praise God. So, um, so yeah, we have to make an effort. And it, as I said before, it takes effort to build relationships. Uh, Non Christians can be hard work. Coming back to my friend Sid, he's in prison now, and um, I thought, well, I've got to go up and see him. And that was not an easy process. You've got to go through, jump through quite a few hoops to be able to get into the prison. And, then, and when you go up there, you've got to make your appointment. When you get up there, you've got to wait half an hour. Then you've got to go through all the security protocols, and they search you and make sure you're not got any anything illegal, and so on. And then, um, so that was right. Then I'd go in and see the guy, and I thought, oh well, he'll be pleased to see me. So I go, oh, hey, how are you going, Sid? How's it going today? Oh, another day, same bleep, bleep, bleep. I go, oh no. And I'm sitting there, and I'm thinking, okay, and um, how are you? Not bad. 
oh, this is hard work. I'm trying to encourage the guy, and he's just the guy's bitter. He's angry. He didn't even he didn't think he should be there. So of course you could understand it to a degree, but it was it was hard work. And say, so, yeah, okay, okay, well, um, oh, a nice day, and you know you sort of try and make small talk and conversation and cheer him up. And hope you heard from your family. No. Nope. Oh, okay, um, uh, okay, uh, and you're trying to think of something else to say to keep the conversation going. It can be, it can be hard work, but uh, you do it nonetheless. Okay, you do it nonetheless, and you keep going and you persevere. So, um, it does take effort to um, to uh, sometimes connect with non Christians, but you know we've got to prepare to leave our comfort zone and, and make some effort and make some sacrifice. Galatians six nine says, "Let's not become weary in doing good. Let's not become weary in doing good." All right, so prepare to make an effort. Point three, be a good listener. Um, verse 30, he said, Philip heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. The eunuch was sitting, uh, as the story said, in the chariot reading the, uh, reading the book of Isaiah. And uh, the Holy Spirit told Philip to go over and, and join the chariot. And he drew close enough to hear him reading from Isaiah the prophet. Now, this is a good thing about listening. We should all be keen to listen. listen uh, listening to people uncovers where they're at. It uncovers needs. You soon find where someone's at, and you find a way to connect with them, something that's relevant to them. That's the key. What do I have in common with them? And it helps us then have a relevant discussion. This is a, this is a principle for life, not just for, for the gospel. Listening shows we care, that we're generally interested. Proverbs 18, 13 says this, He who answers before listening, that's his folly and his shame. And we don't want to just spurt off and talk about whatever we want to talk about. You should be listening to people. Generally, listening is better before talking, okay? Generally better to listen before talking. So he heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet, which leads on to question, uh, point four. Ask relevant questions. He said to him, do you understand what you're reading? He asked a question that reveals needs. This is what we're trying to discover. Where are people at? What are their needs? So he asked the Ethiopian if he understood what he was reading. And of course, he was reading from the Old Testament, which can be hard to understand. Philip knew that. So it was, it was a valid question. Everybody has needs. Everybody has needs, folks. They're asking questions inside of them. Our job is to try and find out what are they? What's going on? That boss of mine that I talked about before, that I you know, basically just shared you know, my Christian faith. Um, and of course, after I'd done that, I had a right then, and that's the way it works with conversation. You ask somebody their view, then you've got a right to say your view sort of thing. That's generally how it works, doesn't it? So then once he had said his part, I was then able to say, well, actually, um, you know, what do you believe? That was a good question, wasn't it? What do you believe? And so I thought this guy actually would be the most secular, non-religious or Christian type of person you could ever meet. And it's, he says to me, oh, he says, oh, no, no, I believe. I says, what? I just knew that he wasn't a Christian. I'm, I'm sorry, you shouldn't judge, but I, I just, there's no way this guy was a Christian. And I'm going, oh, yeah, well, what's that? He said, oh, yeah, no, I'm a, and it transpires. He said, I'm on the board of one of the biggest traditional huge church in Auckland. If I said the cathedral's name, you'll know about it, denominational church. He said, oh, I'm on the board. I said, oh, wow, so you believe in God? He said, oh, I'm not sure about that. I said, oh, okay. Uh, and I said, okay. So I said, what about the Bible? Do you believe, do you believe in the Bible? And he said, oh, some of it. I said, oh, okay, okay, okay. I said, well, you know, this is what I believe. And so I was able to share him. So do you believe that Jesus lived a real life, was a real person, that he died on the cross? That he, and I went through the whole gospel message with him. By asking the question, okay, he revealed something, and I was then able to share my part. Very important principle. Ask relevant questions. And then if they speak, then you've got a right to speak. It makes it so much easier rather than just trying to force a view on somebody. Ask relevant questions. And focus on where their concerns are. Find the common ground. Proverbs 15, 23 says, A man finds joy in giving an apt reply, and how good is a timely word. Isn't that beautiful? Great wisdom in the book of Proverbs. Okay, so point four was ask questions. Point five, there's only seven. Point five is meet a need. The Ethiopian said to him, How can I? Unless someone explains it to me. Verse 31. So the need revealed. He needed someone to explain it to him. Now, Philip had obviously indicated he could help. He had been gentle. He had been respectful, no doubt. Been kind and polite and pleasant in the way he had talked with the Ethiopian because the Ethiopian invited him into his chariot. Well, you don't get invited into the chariot unless you've been a reasonably nice person, I would suggest. 
So he had done things right. And he said in verse 34, Please tell me, who is the prophet talking about? So the need here, well, in this case, was an explanation. Many times, and most times, actually, it's more of a practical need. Um, in fact, with um, my friend Sid, uh, he was in prison, I visited him, but then a practical need came up. He came up for parole. And, um, but one of the conditions of the parole was that he was going to have to be deported back to his native country. And that's what he wanted, so there was no problem there. But they wouldn't let him out into the community while all that was being arranged unless he had a place to stay. And he knew nobody. He had no money. Now, my mother had just passed away a bit earlier on this year. And her house was on the market and was empty. Uh, furniture was still all in there. Everything was there, everything you needed. And so Holy Spirit said, well, <laughs> you know, don't look to who else can solve it. He said, if you're there, you meet the need. And I said, okay. So I said, Sid, you can come and stay at my mum's place. And so we went through all the protocol with corrections and the probation people. And yes, they came around and inspected it and signed it all off and put all the security measures in place. And uh, so he came and he, and he stayed at, um, at, at mum's place. And that showed, and he started to soften then. He really started, and, and, and in the prison he was quite, barriers were up, I tell you. It was hard, hard work. Nine years of hard work. And I didn't go up every week or anything like that, don't get me wrong. But, you know, it was, it was hard yakka. But his, his heart softened. And he moved into the home. And it was quite a very nice home, very well appointed, comfortable, safe, secure. And it shows. And that's what we do when we meet needs. It shows people we're not just all talk, that we are sincere, that we really do love. And um, that we care. And that, you know, what it does is it earns us the right in a way to go further. And um, as I say, through relationship and showing we care, we earn the right to share our faith. Now, what happened was, he's in my mum's house and he's, the arrangements are going in for him to be deported. And um, the, uh, the date got set, praise God, and he was due to leave the country. And I thought, man, I've just got to share the gospel with this guy before he goes. I haven't come all this way. 10 years, 13 years of my life, you know. Um, no, well, no, yeah, 13, 12 years um, just to not now share the gospel. I mean, I've done all these other things. I've got to get the gospel to the guy. And so uh, it was Easter. And I thought, right. So I go around there and I talk to him. I said, well, you know, what do you believe about Easter? Do you know much about Easter? Ask a question. And he gives me his view. And oh, actually, it was, it, was, it was a better answer than I thought. Better answer than probably a lot of people would give. Uh, he certainly knew it was about Jesus. And I said, well, let me explain what it's all about. And then we would sit down over a cup of tea and I didn't have to rush. He had all the time in the world and where I was able to go through the whole gospel message. It was just wonderful and beautiful. We had this amazing time. And he was really touched. He was really touched. You know, the Holy Spirit had prepared him and opened up his heart. And uh, I was able to share that seed with him. And I believe, and I'm praying, he didn't give his heart to the Lord then and then, but I'm believing for his salvation. I believe, just like the Ethiopian eunuch, he's going back to India, he's going to get saved, and he's going to influence thousands over there. In this family. That's what I'm believing. I don't know. I'll find out when I get to heaven, I guess. But I do what I can. Make the most of the opportunities, folk church. That's what I'm talking about here. So we got to this point, which is point six, to share the gospel. So he said, please tell me what the prophet is talking about, verse 34. In verse 35, Philip began with that very passage of scripture, and he told them the good news about Jesus. Philip used this opportunity to explain the gospel from Isaiah 53, which was a messianic prophecy about Jesus and all the suffering and how he, he was going to face and how he would die on the cross and lay down his life. An amazing, amazing part of prophecy from Scripture. Philip explained the gospel. The man believed. Remember, he wanted to get baptized. The Holy Spirit had been prepared and all the way had prepared this man's heart for this time. Now, Philip didn't remember go off on his own personal pet subject. He used what the eunuch was interested in to explain the gospel. That is such a key principle for us. And so Philip began with that very scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. And this is so important. It's just like Sid. If I'd done all that thing without sharing the gospel, I wouldn't say a waste of time, but I would have missed the main thing. <laughs> so we've got to take our opportunity. We've got to get to that. The right time. The right time. The time wasn't right in prison. I mean, I shared a bit about my faith with them up there, why I did what I did. I'm coming to see you because I'm a Christian. That's what Jesus would do for you. God loves you. I've shared those sort of things. And they're all good news, but they're not the gospel, the full gospel. And I was, so, you know, um, we must be able to explain the full gospel. You see, in order for a person to accept truth, 
they must first hear the truth preached. To believe, they must first hear. Romans 10, 13 and 14. It says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one whom they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they're not heard of? It just makes sense to me. And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? This is the point. The whole exercise was to share the gospel with this man. And that's what evangelism is. It's sharing the gospel. So our God, our, sorry, our job is to share the message. We can't save anyone. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. But we have to first explain it. And I've used this example before if you've been part of this church for any time. And I think it's just a beautiful example. It's a bit like the human heart. We can say the human heart is like a lock. Okay? And the key to open that lock is the gospel message. And it's our job to insert the key. In other words, to share the gospel, to preach the message. But the only one who can turn the key is the Holy Spirit. He's the one that opens people's hearts. He reveals Jesus. He's the one that convicts of sin and draws people to faith. It's a miracle. It's a mystery. It's wonderful. The gospel is so powerful. Romans 1.16. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power. It's the dunamis power of God for the salvation for everyone who believes. That message in itself will touch people's hearts and will be enough to get them saved. We've got to preach the gospel. We stand up for Jesus. We proclaim the God. I believe, in fact, the most powerful declaration of our faith. We can sing songs. We can you know, lift hands, whatever. We can talk to each other. But our most powerful declaration and statement of our faith is when we share the gospel with someone else because it's telling people about the attributes of Jesus Christ, just acknowledging him as Lord and Savior. Very, very powerful. Point seven, we share the gospel, and then, if possible, we lead them to the Lord. Because the guy said in verse 37, the eunuch said, Why shouldn't I be baptized? They traveled along the road for a while, during which time... I believed, we don't know how long that was, but during that time, I believe he gave his life to Jesus. And then they came to some water by the side of the road, and he asked to be baptized, which would be proof of his belief, wouldn't it? You're not going to get baptized unless you've uh, uh, been saved. So then both Philip, in verse 38, it says, Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. And as soon as they came out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him, and he went on his way rejoicing. There's rejoicing. Another true sign of someone being born again. If you're not rejoicing when you're saved, something's wrong. And so we see he went away rejoicing. And now this story reveals, as I say, the importance of three things. And I hope you got this this morning. The Holy Spirit's leading and being able to hear and recognize his voice. Follow them. Make the most of those opportunities. The word of God, the power of the gospel message, and a willing human being. That's you, that's me. We see a great example here of how we were to work in harmony with the Word and the Spirit in reaching somebody. It's not complicated, but it's very powerful. So in summary, we should be committing to be willing, to engaging with this world. Not arguing and fighting and criticizing, but engaging with the love of God and the truth of God's Word and the particularly the Gospel message. We need to be following the leading of the Spirit. Oh, boy, we need Holy Spirit like never before. Make sure your relationship's right. Stay close. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Same thing. Obey the Spirit. So when you hear it, oh, don't argue. I mean, yes, sometimes some things need to be prayed over and discussed. But follow the leading of the Spirit. Obey the Spirit. Step out of our comfort zone. Be prepared to make an effort does cause for some inconvenience and sacrifice sometimes. Ask relevant questions and listen. Key to uncovering needs. Meet a need. Demonstrate the love of God. There's that old saying, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Then, when the time's right, we share the gospel. We share the gospel, the power of God under salvation. And then, we lead them to the Lord and we baptize them. Now, these principles are not just for Philip. As I say, they're for us today. 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, set Christ apart as Lord. I hope he's, you've set him apart in your heart as Lord. And then always be ready to give an answer for the reason, for the hope that you have. But do it with gentleness and respect. Next week, I'm going to help you with that. We're going to continue on that answer, the reason for our hope, the gospel. Um, the gospel clearly explaining who Jesus is, what he's done, and why people need him. And all Christians, as I say, need to be able to explain it.
Thank you for your time. Let's pray. Father, we want to uh, just thank you, Lord, again, that you have uh, called us out of darkness into your glorious light, to be a light into the world. And so, Lord, we just thank your Holy Spirit that uh, we're not alone, that you're in us, you're guiding us, you're leading us, Lord. And we just say, give us ears to hear what you're saying. Lord, stir our hearts, Lord, and help us to recognize the opportunities around us that we may make the most of them and that we would be ready to give an answer for the hope that we have. For we're not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God under salvation for all those who would believe. Father, I pray that you would be just touching each person here today, those that are watching online. Visit them, Lord, and just see the connections that they can make, already have around them, Lord, and give them the boldness, the courage to stand up for you, to speak truth, to stand up for righteousness, to speak life, to bless, and to share the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for watching Victory Christian Center. For more content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or you can subscribe to our podcasts on Spotify, iTunes or Google Podcasts. Check out our website at victory.net.nz. We'll see you again soon.